Hi, good, mor um, good morning. Um, just great day in San Diego. It's a little cloudy, but um, you know, it's a lot warmer. Uh, it's a, lot, a little cooler than Tokyo, so or Kobe, where I am. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to be able to speak to you and uh, introduce some of our efforts regarding our the, probably what will be the biggest ARM machine ever, or the biggest supercomputer ever to be created in, in the world. So before I go on, just tell you who you are. You know, I'm the director of the center of uh, one of the weekend centers with our 15 research centers weekend. Weekend is like, you know, if so those of you who don't know, it's, uh, it's the biggest uh, national lab, research lab in Japan. It's a public lab, like, so it's like Max Planck in Europe, or maybe like one of the DOE labs in, in the US. So you know, we've got thousands of people and you know, researchers. But we, again, we are one of the 15 centers, research centers in, in weekend. Other centers do like you know, biology, physics, but we are the center of uh, computation. And what we do, uh, in summary, is we study computing and uh, computing in the high end. So what we say, our slogan is science of computing by computing and for computing. And those of you who have studied US history probably know where the paraphrase came from. Um, but no, our subject matter is computing. We also apply computing to other branches of science, and also we uh, collaborate with other disciplines of science that allows us to accelerate computing, and that's our whole agenda. Okay? And then, um, uh, so we're a research lab. We are situated, so Weekend's headquarters is in actually the suburbs of Tokyo, but our center actually uh, is located um, uh, near Kobe, and we know what Kobe is good for. Right. Yeah. Well, actually, they're not really, technically, they're not raised in the city of Kobe. The city of Kobe is urban, so, uh, so you don't see any cows. Although we have lots of wild boars roaming around for some reason, uh, from the mountains. But um, we're located here. It's a big building. Uh, we're located right in the tip of this uh, landfill, very large landfill. There's another landfill airport, so we're just one station away from the, from the airport. So if, you're local, if you ever come, if you want to visit, uh, let us know, and uh, uh, once we have the new machine, we can take you on the tour. Um, so, uh, so like I said, the mission of our center is to do research. So we publish papers and do all kind of stuff. We have hundreds of researchers in the area. But the other responsibility we have is to, uh, run, to uh, design, build, and operate the flagship supercomputer in Japan. There are many other supercomputers in Japan, and there's a coalition of supercomputing centers, much like, if you know, like Exceed. Uh, actually, US, UCSD is one of the, uh, the SDSC, not USCSC, SDSC, for example, is um, at US, UCSD, is um, one of the Exceed uh, centers. And just like, just like that, we one of the, what's called, what we call HPCI centers in Japan. But the difference is we're the flagship center. So we're tier one, all the other centers are tier two in Japan. And being a tier one center, we, uh, up until very recently, we operated this, uh, uh, built, we built and operated this skate computer, which was a flagship machine for Japan. And, uh, you know, it was the uh, fastest supercomputer in the world by various metrics, not only in the top 500 ranking, uh, which is the most famous, but other rankings too, like the HPCG, or which does, you do conjugate gradient, or things like graph 500, where you do graph analytics. And, um, uh, in fact, this is, and we also won many accolades uh, in applications like the Gordon Bell Prize with the machine. And in fact, uh, K-Computer was the first machine to retire. Actually, we just retired it. It was a big retirement ceremony, uh, end of August. It was the biggest uh, uh, retirement. It retired as incumbent number one on the graph processing, uh, superseding every other supercomputers or cloud or you know, any other infrastructure being able to solve the biggest, world's largest uh, graph problems like you do in social networks. So, um, so uh, it's so a machine, uh, retired with lots of accolades, um, coverage by all the TV stations, news, so, you know, it became a national event. But what, how, why did we retire the machine? Well, to make room for the next one, which we have been planning for uh, many years. The new machine, Haraku, Naku means Mount Fuji. Um, it's, the, it's the other name for, uh, it's the alternative name for Mount Fuji. Well, those of you who can read um, Chinese or Japanese characters, you know, this is Fugaku. So, um, so it's a big, it's a new supercomputer we're building. It's ARM-based, and that's why I'm here. Uh, okay. 
or you know, Intel based, maybe, you know, maybe, I don't know. Um, it's ARM based, but it was built in mind uh, with two very two large objectives. One is to, of course, to achieve very, the highest peak uh, in, in the world, you know, being able to run these uh, flagship applications have extra, uh, extreme performance uh, that can only and you know, solve problems that can only be solved by you know computers of this magnitude. But the other is uh, the other objective, which we did not fulfill with with K, was to have a very broad base, very broad adoption, and not just the machine itself, but have a very broad proliferation of technology we had developed in the ARM ecosystem. So more users. Um, you know, uh, uh, not just capacity, but more broader sets of applications than just traditional simulation-based applications, data science, artificial intelligence, and so forth, and much broader user base, not just in academia, industry, or, you know, ha well, or even have these uh, technologies that are the, the right processors going to clouds for people to use them in, uh, like, to become the server end of the IoT applications. Okay, so that was the objective. So that's the, this broad adoption is the, was the other objective. And if you look at, you know, now Fuji, you know, it's like that. It has, a very, it has the highest peak in Japan, but also as a standalone mountain, has a very, very beautiful um, broad base. Okay, so, so that's our idealism. So just to, for, for the remaining of time, you know, if you're reading email on your smartphones or do stuff like that, just to, but this is one key slide. The rest of the stuff is just explanation of all this. So this ARM, uh, so what we have done is to build a new processor, ARM FX, uh, six, A64FX or ARM64FX uh, with Fujitsu. And um, this processor, is, it's a new processor. It has nothing to do with any of the ARM IP except for the instruction set. It's in a brand new processor and it's a processor that's all, uh, is a standard CPU, but also it's been optimized for HPC workloads. So most other processors, including like Xeons and so forth, or, uh, or you know, they have HPC capabilities, but they're not, not optimized for it. I'm sorry, but you know, this is a fact. You know, they can run HPC workloads well, but their main point of optimization is to, you know, let's say, be in the cloud, or you know, run your notebooks, or be in the cloud, and you know, run video streaming. Whereas this, so if, if your workload is that, that's the processor you're by, and that's why, you know, until selling like billion processors in the market, oh, about 100 billion processors in the market. But, um, but this processor is entirely HPC optimized. So uh, as extremely, extreme high bandwidth compared to standard processors, like again, standard um, CPUs, it has all over order of magnitude higher memory bandwidth. And memory bandwidth is very important for HPC applications and also for many other apps. It's uh, fairly high flops. It's like uh, you know, three teraflops in peak. Has extremely high embedded network uh, bandwidth. As uh, every processor, every chip has 400 gigabits worth of uh, bandwidth going going in and out to the interconnect. So think of every every node in your cloud having 400 G Ethernet. It's the equivalent of that. And then uh, there are various AI supports. So just like no, GPUs, we have uh, FP16 intake support. But it's still a general purpose CPU. It's not like a GPU, it's not a special purpose accelerator, it's still a very generic C CPU. And it doesn't, have, uh, it doesn't have embedded GPU, just the standard ARM-based cores. ARM-based cores, well, runs the ARM free version 8.2 instruction set, extension with SVE. So the entire, the chip can run, you know, it can run Red Hat, when we had the chip the first, for the first time from the fabs, it just booted a RHEL out of the box. No modifications, just booted everything right there. And uh, it can run Windows with a little bit of driver support, but it can run Windows, so it can even run Word. So, right, so what will probably be the first fastest Word processor. <laughs> <laughs> And moreover, what's, what would be a processor, you know, the TDP, the processors are kind of rising. You know, now as you see on the server, front, you see processors like 200 watts or even like 220 watts, the recent announcement by like AMD and so forth. Or even uh, uh, Intel's um, 
um, uh, uh, some of the uh, high-end um, uh, offerings are in the hundreds of watts. But this, I can't disclose the power numbers yet uh, very soon, but this processor is also very, very power efficient, extremely power efficient. Um, so it's, no, it's much lower than its com uh, competing tiers. So combined with the higher performance and lower power, in, ter in terms of power performance and some of the applications we have seen, or e or even order, over order of magnitude, faster application performance on a per chip basis compared to, let's say, a Xeon, high-end Xeon. Okay. And then we take that processor, and of course it's been built to scale. Okay, it's a you know it's a par it's for a parallel machine. So there are more than so we're building a machine that's more than uh, 150,000 of these nodes integrated into a single machine. And so we get something like 150,000 150 petabytes per second memory bandwidth. In terms of the number of nodes, it supersedes a little bit more Sequoia which was a blue gene machine in terms of number of nodes. Of course, each processor would be much more powerful. And then um, we get 60 petabits of uh, injection bandwidth aggregate into, the, uh, into this uh, interconnect, which is about 10 times all the cloud vendors' internal data center in internal traffic aggregated, but it's an order of magnitude of higher capability. So that's the amount of interconnect bandwidth and bring onto the system. And then we have you know, petabytes of MVM storage and, ten, and uh, up to 10,000 endpoint uh, I.O. network. Uh, it'll be a little less than that, but with the, with the capability. So in terms of the, it will not be exaflop machine per se, but in terms of the capability of when we start, when every, everybody in the HPC community start thinking about what the exascale machine could be. This is the first machine in the world to be achieving the level of performance that's expected at an exascale. But of course, we want the technology to proliferate, like I told you. So, um, so we've been working, but we have been working on this for 10 years, and uh, if you, if I publish this, I think they'll publish the slides so you can look at the details, but in fact, we were working on, they started working on this machine when K was deployed in 2011. So, so we've been working on this for almost like eight, eight nine years, uh, for a very long time, but we're finally, at the very last stage of um, deploy, um, being able to deploy it. How do we achieve this? Well, it was really a very uh, art articulate uh, code design process involving a lot of the advanced applications that were running on the K as well as on the other supercomputers we had. So we had a whole bunch of, you know, we got the entire application community, HPC application community in Japan involved in doing a code design with, uh, with, us, with us in our lab, our center as well as Fujitsu. And um, so there was a very tight relationship going on. And um, you know, there's a whole talk about this. I won't go into detail today. But basically, this tight collaboration, we, were, we picked nine representative applications from the nine areas, uh, and nine areas being what are called priority issues. And there were, of course, application um, uh, projects in each of the nine areas, very similar to, if you're familiar with DOE's co-design centers, it's very similar. But we had areas like uh, pharmaceuticals, we had areas like uh, disaster and environment, and areas like energy, uh, storage, delivery, um, also generation, and we had manufacturing, uh, materials, so actually material sciences, manufacturing, and also, but you know, more traditional macro scale, macroscopic scale manufacturing, like, you know, like turbines and, and airplanes and cars and so forth. And then we had uh, some, some basic science, but uh, most of these, all of these applications are of high interest to the society. So we took nine applications from them, and our objective was to, you know, for, for these applications, you know, we inquired all the scientists, you know, inquired them like, you know, what's your goal in five years, 10 years time, what's your computational requirement, what are the algorithms you're using, how, how do you stay competitive in the field, and so forth, so everything combined um, the goal was set to have the applications run uh, at, you know, some of the applications run more than 100 times faster than K. On the average, you know, to, um, no, somewhat comparable to that, like, you know, 30 times, 40 times, 50 times faster than K. And that, and, um, that was a co-design target. And, you know, and uh, as I'll tell you later, we have high expectation reaching that. So now you know why we decommissioned K because the next machine will be, you know, 
4,200 times faster. Right? So there's no point in keeping the old machine around anymore. So, um, so what are the apps? Well, I can give you a few samples. Um, there are lots of, uh, a lot of comprehensive uh, examples. Oops. Uh, let me turn off the sound. Yeah. So this is a, a multi-proteomic um, simulation. So usually the, the so molecular dynamic simulation is the stuff you see on the right-hand side. You have a single, a single molecule protein, and then you simulate like folding. But in reality, when you want to do, so let's say, drug design, you really need to think of the holistic environment. You need to think of like membranes or the inner cell, inside the cell. You need to really calculate all the interactions of the proteins themselves, of course, which are composed of all the atoms. So it turns into this multi-scale, multi-proteomic -prote um, simulation involving you know, thousands or even, even more of that, you know, proteins like that. And so you need to be able to sol solve this entire system. And you can't do that without having a very large machine. The other would be something like the whole global atmospheric simulation. And, uh, you know, because, you know, at least in Japan, we believe in global warming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah. And we think it's an important problem, societal problem. So, uh, so of course, you need to be able to simulate various scenarios. And, but for that, you need to be able to simulate, uh, ideally, you need to be able to simulate sub-kilometer scale uh, resolution in your simulation. Otherwise, you can, because of physics, you can't simulate the clouds directly. The clouds, if you have a coarser mesh, like five kilometers, then you have to, the clouds are actually sort of emulated, but they're not exact. But being under sub-kilometer allows you to uh, do this, this, this type of simulation in real resolution, uh, uh, in, in reality. And you know, thus you can, you know, the typhoon and all that. Uh, but of course, in order to do this, uh, integrate this on a time scale, so in 50 years, 100 years, you need really big machines. And, uh, so we achieved high resolution on K, but in order to do real science, we need to have the power to accelerate by at least two orders of magnitude, and we'll achieve that with Fugaku. And like health, we can simulate the heart. Now we can simulate hearts directly. So, you know, you know heart of vascular illness is one of the, you know, the biggest killer in the U.S. But now, uh, in, uh, in the very close future, we'll have capabilities to simulate the entire heart. Of course, we, in fact, we can do it now. And this allows you to do various what if analysis. What if you have an anomaly? What if you do surgery? What's the correct, uh, how do you diagnose these things? How do you do the corrective surgery? What's the most effective uh, drugs or any sort of, uh, uh, any sort of uh, solutions to the problem that's more, most effective? And this is a very exact simulation. Exact, you're simulating the cells themselves. You, you're simulating the blood flow. You're simulating all the electrical pulses. So it's all multi-physics simulation. Again, this is only possible with very large machines. And finally, um, something that has to do with things like IoT. Well, this is our IoT at macroscopic scale. So we have the, all these advanced radars like that, like weather, like phase array radars. But what we really want to do, and this is also um, uh, advocated recently in the, uh, some of the people in the IoT community. For example, one of my old friends, uh, Rich Wolski at Santa Barbara, he's doing lots of IoT stuff. But given his IO HPC background, he's saying, well, you really need HPC to once you have the data, you need to simulate things. And, you, and what you really do is to have the data, incoming data stream, you have the simulation, you try to couple them together. And that's called data simulation. So, um, but, but to simulate anything like weather, you need to assimilate this uh, it's kind of a simulation you just saw you know, in, in the climate. Then you need to assimilate with uh, terabytes of incoming data. And that's not a very trivial problem. But you know, this is like IoT at very macro, at, at very very large scale. So not only you need to methods to acquire the data, but you also need ways to utilize the data. And it's not just analytics to do real you know to do real advanced stuff. You need to couple that with simulations. Okay, so analytics plus simulation that's very really important. So with that in mind, again we designed this chip, um, which uh, so uh, there were a lot of stuff we did right with K. So we inherited that. And um, so again, it's very easy to program. You know, but it's a large machine. But you can basically, all the programs that ran on K runs on this machine without modifications. Um, we retained the bytes per flop ratio. 
uh, a lot of the new modern designs, they compromised the memory bandwidth to just to try to get the superficial flops up, but uh, we didn't do that. Um, we retained the bytes for flop. Uh, so um, there's a lot of ease of use and 100 times speed up. However, the new innovations we put into the machine because the uh, was is important because, like I said, for proliferation, we really needed this for broad adoption. So one difficulty with K was the fact that the processor was kind of subpar. Well, it was not bad, but compared to, let's say, Intel offerings of, of the comparable times, the processor was, you know, was not slower, but by, by and large the same performance. We tested a lot of applications. And, um, and that really has no compelling market value, right? Because, you know, if you have some processor, and by the, ton, by the way, K was running a Spark. You know, if you're, anybody who's used Spark stations, I'm sure you're very familiar with uh, what it was. But you know, it, was a, it, was a, it was sort of a dying ecosystem. So if you have a processor, you know, a Spark processor, and you have a, a XA6 processor, they, they perform by and large the same. There's no compelling reason to buy Spark. Right? So you need some compelling reason, which is like performance, a much higher performance that will, that will you know, get you over the edge and adopt the new infrastructure. Also need to be very green, right? Because data centers these days are very power limited and um, being eco-friendly is very important, not just for cost, but for environmental responsibilities. It's not just putting data centers up north where the electricity is cheap. You're still using coal, let's say. And, or you may be using carbon neutral power sources, but then some other, other people are just using, you know, carbon, uh, using coal to fill the gap. So we really need to build something ecologically friendly as an IT infrastructure itself, not to move your data center somewhere to make it look like it's green. And of course, it has to be part of the global ARM ecosystem, uh, some global software ecosystem. ARM for us was the primary target because ARM ships more than, you know, 20 billion chips each year. So this chip will sit at the pinnacle of the ARM, overall ARM ecosystem. And of course, you know, we want what we call Society 5.0 in Japan is like, uh, uh, it's a new days and age of, of IT or like Neoverse in ARM terminology. It's largely the same thing. Um, you know, there's a com com combination of uh, simulation with big data, AI, everything, and, uh, and sec block, uh, security, including blockchain. But this, these processors need to be the power source of that. So that's, so that's a chip we developed. And, uh, and by the way, it's real. In fact, you know, it's working. It's being mass produced right now uh, in, in Taiwan. And uh, it's a seven nanometer chip. And um, has a high bandwidth memory. This uh, Sarah Brock has lots of certies for high, high bandwidth uh, output into the network and also PCI and so forth. And uh, so you see the chip here at the center. You see the HBMs uh, right, next, right, right next to it using silicon nanoposer. And of course, it has 48, actually, it has 52 cores, ARM cores inside. And uh, I won't go into the details of the architecture. If you're interested, there are several materials that's been published by Fujitsu. There are several talks about me and others. So basically, we have a uh, third, uh, we have what's called CMGs, core memory groups, four of them in a chip. They're connected by a cache coherent high, high bandwidth uh, interconnect. But each of these CMGs have uh, 13 cores, 12 of which are user cores, but all the cores are connected by crossbar. So by being connected by crossbar, there's extremely high bandwidth between the chip, between the cores. And then there's a level two cache, and there's a memory controller. And this, if you're, in, if, so if you're into any of the architecture stuff, this kind of configuration looks very familiar. It doesn't look like a CPU. I mean, the core is a CPU, but it doesn't like a CPU, like a CPU. In fact, it looks very much like a GPU, okay? if you know the arc, processor architectures. In fact, that's exactly what it is. So one, on one hand, ACE4FX, one way to look at ACE4FX is, you know, it's a mini core, again, it's a mini core ARM CPU with all the intrinsic CPU properties. It runs all the standard codes, you know, it has, it's a mini core, single threaded performance is kind of, is okay, very high band, uh, performance due to higher bandwidth than vectorization, but still it's the CPU core. But architecturally, um, the the underfootings of the like processor interconnects and everything, plus the vectorization engine, 
makes the processor behave also like a GPU. So, it's a, so it has a very high streaming, data streaming and processing capability. In fact, you know, it has the same memory subsystem as, let's say, Volta, you know, a terabyte per second memory bandwidth. It has the same sort of uh, uh, vector, you know, very you know, wide vector lanes. And it has uh, other memory and uh, streaming memory enhancement features, like, uh, like something like cache localization, has a very, has like, um, also being able to synchronize uh, very fast uh, scatter gather uh, uh, support, and it has uh, other uh, enhanced performance enhancing features uh, in synchronizing all the cores and so forth. So again, these are features you find <coughs> in GPUs, and you find them also in this chip. It's not again, you know, it's a lot of some people ask the question: Is there a GPU embedded? No. There's no GPU embedded in the chip, but it's the CPU cores and the aggregate underfootings and the memory subsystem that makes it behave also like a GPU, not just a CPU. Okay, so that's the beauty of the chip. So what's the real performance? Well, so uh, the Himeno benchmark is, is a CFD, computational fluid dynamics benchmark that's very famous. It's a micro benchmark, so the sc scores may be a little inflated. Uh, but uh, we, again, that's a very, it's a benchmark that everybody does, so we did it. And um, so this is Xeon. This is, by the way, this is a uh, Skylake Platinum. And it's two socket, so it's two chips, okay? So, it's, so a single chip performance is about half of this. And this is a performance of the AC4FX CPU. So compared to a dual socket Xeon node, it's about four times faster, okay? And then, um, even compared to like Volta or Sky or SXOR, which is a dedicated vector chip, it's faster by, it's faster than they are. So on a, on a, on a per socket basis, this chip is about eight times faster than Xeon on a, on a test CFD workload. And by the way, lower power. On a, so that was a rather synthetic workload. So on the real workload, of course, in some cases, case the differences become smaller. So this is WERF. WERF is a weather, is a very famous weather code um, in the US. And of course, with, with real weather code, you have other things like boundary conditions and <coughs> some physics, which are more drip, more can, can, can compute bound and compute bound workloads the are actually doing, will do a lot better. But, but largely, even so, this is, again, this is a dual socket. And this is, uh, this is a one CPU, a single socket and it's about 56% faster, or about three times faster on a per socket basis. And of course, this is, on a, even on per socket basis, uh, the CPU is much lower power. So that's, so that's the performance. And uh, it's integrated in this way, and under our configuration, there are other configurations, uh, like the air cool one. Uh, we have, because of our scalability, we have this uh, liquid cooling package, uh, about 384 sockets, uh, nodes per, no, per, per rack. Um, you see there are no dims because all the memory is embedded in the chip. And then we can interconnect that with the Tofu network, which has 40 gigabytes per second, or almost 20 gigabits per second. But also the latency is in the sub-microsecond, about 0.5 mi microsecond um, from node to node, which is, you know, eth which is 100 times faster than Ethernet. <laughs> Uh, in lower latency than Ethernet. So we connect that. Let me skip over. And then um, we integrated that in a hierarchical fashion, and we have more than 150K nodes. So right now here, we ended the uh, KIA computer operations. Uh, by December, our, we started an installation, and for, by the first half, we will have the whole machine. So um, if you put this together, it's about, um, so we did a lot of NRE, of course, we paid a lot of money for it. But overall, it paid off because, you know, had we built this out of off-the-shelf chips, then it would have cost three times, probably three times more, and machine three times bigger, and, and we use three times more electricity. Because we designed this chip from ground up for HPC, because we designed this to be power efficient, because we designed this to be integrated, we got our efficiency. It was a lot of years of work, but we got this. So just to put you in perspective, this 
uh, compared to, let's say, my, my, my iPhone uh, XS Max. Okay? Um, this machine as a whole uh, for HPC workflow is about 20 million times faster. So that's like all the cell phones, that's like comparable to all the cell phones shipped in Japan over a year. So think of all, all the cell phones in a single big, uh, a big country being, aren't now, being just concentrated into a single group. So that's the, you know, that's the magnitude of the scale of this machine. So um, we did reach 100 times in some of the apps. Some are like 30, some are 40. Uh, but and we know that we will be reaching 100 times. But again, the software base is generic R, plus SVE for vectorization. But everything you expect to run on, you know, on let's say, your XA6 cluster, if it can be just recompiled or adjusted a little bit, will run on R. And there's been lots of precedents work that have proven that ARM ecosystem is credible. HPC, you know, there are a lot of people who have done this work, say, on Thunder X2, but to sh and they have shown this to be credible. But now, this everything will run much faster. And uh, we're porting many applications, um, uh, and HPC apps, and then eventually, um, but we really want to make this go into the cloud by first providing our services at the back end to in, in alliance with the cloud vendors. That's phase one. But in phase two, we really want, once we get adoption, we really want these chips to go into the clouds directly themselves to offer HPC services and AI services and data analytics services at high performance combining cloud to the edge. So it'll be the, you know, you have the same arm running on the edge, but you have this, the, the highest performing processor of all times running in the cloud, and we can join. And you know, there are uptakes um, on my talk soon. There are uptakes already. There was announced by, by NS, NSF that the Stony Brook is buying a A64FX based system in the US. It's a Cray system. So now Cray has not made any formal announcement. Fujitsu has made, not made any formal announcement. We have not made any formal announcement. It's an announcement by NSF, okay? So be able to bear that in mind, but the announcement says there will be an A64FX based Cray system installed in Stony Brooks early next year, okay? So um, I'll skip, in the interest of time, I'll skip most of the AI stuff because uh, there will be a talk by my researcher, Alex. Alex, raise your hand. Yeah, the tall guy, yeah. Uh, so Alex will give a talk detailing out our AI plans, especially in training, <coughs> how we can all be able to utilize the power of A64 effects for AI training, much, very much like GPUs. And um, so I won't go into the details of that and since I'm running out of time. But uh, overall, we believe that uh, A64 effects will be a credible um, platform for AI training because simply each of the chip already has like some of the AI acceleration capabilities like low precision support, plus very high plot performance and high bandwidth, but also the interconnects very fast. And when you try to do, uh, nowadays, the real trend is to do scalable training because the networks are getting much more complicated. In fact, compared to the past when we saw like the first AlexNet, some of the demands are six order of magnitude higher compared to the early days in the early 2010s. So high performance parallelization is the only way to achieve training in reasonable amount of time, and we believe that the machine is very fit for that. So, and, um, but um, again, if you're interested, I'll leave the details to Alex um, with respect to what we're doing. And um, overall, um, and so we have lots of AI machines now, some of which I have built uh, in Japan, but there are no public there's very little public AI infrastructure. The reason why HPC has been successful over many years is because in every country, in the US, in Japan, in Europe, and other, in like China recently, there are public sources of being able to access these large machines. And if, and HPC success rests on that from the 1960s. Now with AI, like I said, the real challenge is how to make these complicated networks, deep learning networks perform 
and train them, and you really need a big machine to do that. But do you, can you get access to a big machine? And HPC, yes, for simulation workloads, yes, for, but for AI, there is very little. So we've been building uh, mid-sized systems, and some are very successful, like the, AB, uh, the ABCI system I built last year with 4,000 voltages. And the U.S., just about the only public large-scale AI machine is uh, Oak Ridge's Summit, which has actually 27,000 voltages. And very, very powerful. There's been lots of great results. But, you know, most of the results are dominated by the big players like Google's and Amazon's, who have comparable infrastructures, but, you know, they're not open to the public, or they're very expensive for you to buy out of cloud services. So this resource is very important, and comparing that to Oak Ridge, we only had the aggregate of all the machines, only had like one-fourth to one-fifth of performance. But once we launch Fugaku, um, our capabilities will be, much, will be higher than, than Summit. So not only in simulation workloads, but we expect to be able to drive the forefronts of AI, which of course will be combined with the edge, um, to drive the next generation applications. So it's not just about simulation. It's not just about simple analytics. It's really about scaling to tackle the next generation problems that's ever more co complicated in this, what we, some people call neoverse in our, or what we call society 5.0. And large machines we have built you know, at the very pinnacle of, of our ecosystem will be one of the resources to do that, but we also expect to see very wide proliferation, including those being embedded directly into the cloud. Okay, with that, I'd like to end my talk, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate you coming here and sharing oh, this with pleasure. us. Really super interesting stuff. I wish we had some